So we might ask ourselves, like, uh, especially in the United States, um, why we're still talking about race. Um, and particularly in the United States, one of the reasons people ask this question, there's a series of reasons why they ask the question. Um, one of them is that there's a sense that wasn't there this big transformation in an understanding of race um, at the end of the Civil War, for example, in the first instance, or at least at the end of the Civil Rights Movement, or more recently with the um, election of Barack Obama. Um, so some people would argue that this signaled the end of racism in the United States. That is the moment that a black man or a man with a black father uh, and a white mother could become president, that racism in the U.S. must be over. Um, but, you know, I think I speak now to you all, uh, the time that I've given this lecture is in the middle of July in 2020, um, where there's been major social um, uprest, uh, upheaval, excuse me, um, after the um, death or murder of George Floyd in um, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and a series of protests around Black Lives Matter. And so in some ways, we see the persistence of race um, within American society, and the, in some ways, the absolute centrality of race to understanding the American economy, the U U.S. political system, um, and American culture more generally. Now, the U.S. isn't unique um, in, in this uh, um, dynamic of race, where race is a major structuring force in its society. And in fact, in many places where there are um, uh, more heterogeneous populations, uh, which is to say populations um, where there's a variety of racial and or ethnic groups, and I'll define those two in just a moment, um, it, we see a dynamics of race. We see a way in which um, uh, race has an incredible impact on the life chances of people. And I use that phrase, life chances of people, to remind you of um, some of the ideas that we presented earlier on Max Weber and the ways in which Weber suggests that one of the central elements of thinking about class is to think about what their life chances are. And the intersection of race and class shows the deep ways in which race impacts the life chances of people. And so today we'll talk both about how to think about race, how to define it and make sense of it, as well as how, why it is that race is important um, as one of the major structuring factors for inequality. And so this will include things like talking about organizational racism and institutionalized racism that will include asking ourselves why it is that we stratify our societies in this way. Other countries which have some degree of racial diversity, so for example, throughout much of Latin America, have a set of racial dynamics of their own. They're not the same as the United States, but they're parallel in important ways. And I'll raise some examples of that along the, the way today in our lectures. So race and ethnicity. What is race and what is ethnicity? Race is a system that humans created to classify people based mostly on skin tone but also on um, uh, origin. Ethnicity, by contrast, is a common culture, religion, history, or ancestry shared by a group of people. So race and ethnicity are not the same thing. Um, sometimes they're elided. Uh, sometimes they're not. Sometimes people make the bright distinctions between them. You should think of race as a social construct. That is, it is based in an idea, primarily of skin tone, and it understands that people with different kinds of skin tone are different kinds of people. Now, the origin of this conceptualization of race is fairly contemporary um, by human historical standards. You may not think of it as too contemporary, but it really, uh, begins to solidify as a conceptual framework in the 19th century. Um, it becomes a little bit before then, really the 17th century, 18th century, we see it. But by the 19th, it becomes a major way in which people think about differences between um, uh, one another. And this classificatory impulse emerges in part out of a combination of uh, a study of society that takes as its sort of central orienting feature biology, or another way of putting that, thinking about biological frameworks in order to classify human societies. So some of you may recall from um, biology class about the ways in which species are defined. And um, you may even remember the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. 
and these things, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, gene, species, are different ways in which we can classify living animals or organisms. Um, this can not just include animals, it can, of course, also include plants. And so what is the broad category that something is subsumed under and then what is sort of the subcategories? And these trees of animals um, and plants is to classify them in different ways. That classificatory impulse moved its way into, bled into understandings of society. And then we began to ask, can we think about humans in the same way? That is, can we classify them? Can we classify human beings in parallel ways to the ways in which we classify other parts of the environment? And important to that classic, classificatory impulse was an understanding that maybe different groups of humans were fundamentally different from one another. So what differentiates species, for example, if you think in biological terms? Well, part of what differentiates species is that species cannot breed with one another and create offspring that are themselves fertile. So animals of two different species, even if they're able to have issue from some sexual union, that is, they're able to produce a new animal, that animal will be infertile. That is one of the ways in which we classify species. In this sense, species are thought of as being fundamentally different from one another. Race was a way in which to scientize and biologize differences between humans. It was an attempt to construct a fundamental difference between types of people and to suggest that there was something important to that fundamental difference. In particular, the science of race was oriented to the experience of um, Africans. Uh, and uh, it's not solely applied to Africans. So um, part of the science of race was also interested in Asian populations, or what at the time would have been called Oriental populations. It's a word we will not use anymore in this class. But overall, the idea was maybe there are fundamental differences between groups that suggest that some have different qualities as opposed to others. Now, why? Why did this impulse emerge? Well, in some ways, um, as I've argued in previous lectures, classificatory impulses make the word world known. So insofar as we have classifications of objects, we can begin to categorize them, cluster them together. We can begin to sort of like make sense of them a little bit more easily. But they also serve a sort of social and political purpose. And so we should think about how it is that knowledge is intimately tied up with power, how it is that how we know something, what we know, is tied to a set of power relationships within a society. And so that the scientific knowledge that emerged served as the basis of the concept of race was in part a scientific knowledge based in a logic of domination or a logic of, in order to justify domination of one group of people over another. In other words, race in large part emerges over the European interest in dominating uh, Africans and their children. So eventually what will become African Americans in the United States, but all throughout um, uh, uh, Latin America as well. And um, this justificatory impulse was in part grounded in a logic of slavery. And so when we talk about race and talk about ethnicity, we cannot do so without thinking about slavery. Some of this means that we can't do it without thinking about the long institutional and organizational legacies of slavery. But some of it also means that race was found in a system of domination wherein Europeans sought to justify why it was that they were able to enslave other people. Or thought differently, you know, they're you can see a series of moral problems with enslaving others. And so how is it, uh, particularly among the range of Christian nations, how is it that some group of European whites can justify the um, domination of others? Well, one of the modes of domination, of justification of that domination, was with a racial science, or a science of the differences between groups of people based on phenotype or skin color. Now, Interestingly, one of the things that we see is the ways in which race has changed over time. And as I said in earlier lectures, 
seeing something change over time is a wonderful, wonderful indicator that what you're looking at is a social construction, not just a sheer material reality. So in the U.S. Census, which is the ways in which we gather information about Americans um, every uh, 10 years, the classification over race has changed from time to time and again. And starting in 2000, in a really kind of innovative way, people could begin to pick multiple categories of their race instead of being forced to pick just one. Now, I don't want you to think that before the concept of race, there was no way in which people justified violence against other groups of people, that race was required in order to justify violence between groups. Because actually, there was lots of violence between groups without the concept of race. And indeed, much of the work of the slave trade was done within Africa, not just by whites. And so there's an important dimension in thinking through race where you say it's not necessary to have race to justify domination. But a racialized science allows for particular forms of domination and distinction between groups that we wouldn't get with other forms, which is not to say that it's better or worse, it just is. And we need to understand what that racialized understanding produces within our social communities. Ethnicity is different than it's, it's tied to it. So they're not mutually exclusive concepts. Mutually exclusive concepts meaning um, there's no overlap between them. In the case of ethnicity, there's not mutual exclusivity with race. Ethnicity is thought of as the common culture, religion, history, or ancestry shared by a group of people. And here, ethnicity um, um, suggests the ways in which, or shows us how it is, that um, People with the same racial identity may have different ethnic identities. So if you think um, for yourself, who are the set of people that I have a common cultural or religion or history or ancestry with, this may be produced region. It may be produced by the country that you're from. So I'll again draw upon the United States. There are different ethnic whites. That is, there are different ethnic groups of people who identify as white, but who have different understandings of their culture, religion, history, or ancestry. So for example, we could think about Irish Americans, people who are descended from um, uh, migrants from Ireland as an ethnic group, an ethnic group of whites. So within the racial category of whites, there are different ethnic groups within it, Irish Americans versus Italian Americans, for example. Now, these ethnicities often are based in a shared imagination of community. And we'll think about the communities of ethnicity as in some ways imagined communities. And by imagined communities, what I mean is that often the culture, history, and ancestry are not necessarily like definitive in or absolute in how it is that they constitute people. There's some very interesting work, for example, that shows how it is that there's so many people in the United States who claim Irish ancestry or claim an ethnicity of being Irish American. And one of the explanations for this, there's a bunch of explanations for them, is the political expediency of being Irish for some. And by political expediency, what I mean is that it was advantageous for some people to identify as being Irish. So take, for example, people who may have two parents of two different ethnic groups. That is, parents from uh, one might, for example, be Irish Catholic and the other might be Polish Catholic. The question would be, what, does their, what do their children identify as? And they may choose to identify as more Irish than Polish. And in looking at that choice, in looking at the ways in which people might choose their ethnic identification, what we can see is why it might be more advantageous to be Irish than Polish in American society. And by advantageous, I just mean that identifying as Irish may come with a set of resources and may come with things that give you opportunities in labor markets for a stronger sense of your own identity. And therefore, you would select that ethnicity as a way in which to identify. All of us, to some degree, have ethnic options. And by ethnic options, 
what I mean. It's not, this is not my concept. Um, it actually comes from a scholar named Mary Waters. Mary Waters thinks about ethnic options as the ways in which ethnicity is something that we enact, but we select as part of our own imagined history, culture, and ancestry. So, for example, um, my father, I think I've told you before in one of these lectures, is from Pakistan. My mother is from Ireland. Both of them immigrated to the United States. I have a range of ethnic options or options for the ways in which I might identify ethnically within the United States. I can identify more strongly um, as being an Irish American or a Pakistani American, but even my father's identity as Pakistani is curious because Pakistan wasn't a country when he was born. He was actually born um, before 1947, so before Pakistan and India split. So he could identify, and I could identify, as Indian in some ways. I could say I'm part of this broad ancestral and cultural tradition of northern India, of the Punjab region, and that that is very important to me. Race and ethnicity are things that people do and have done to them. So when we think about them as a social construct, part of the ways in which we conceptualize them is, is how it is that institutions, organizations, and other people do race to us, and how it is through our own actions we enact racialized sensibilities and ways of being. And so there are ways in which I myself can enact through an exercise of a range of ethnic options, a way of doing or being ethnic. Um, race, by contrast, is sometimes more difficult to enact, but we'll talk about how it is because the options may be um, uh, uh, less plural or less able to enact them. But we'll talk about what it means to enact one's race or ethnicity and how to think about the consequences of them. Races and ethnicity are also, of course, things that people do to you. So I have my ethnicity enacted by other people, not trivial or, you know, fairly frequently. I wouldn't say all the time, but it's not uncommon for someone to ask me, where are you from? And that question, where are you from? When I answer it and I say, I'm from New York City, is a pretty unsatisfying answer to most because it's not actually what they're asking. They don't want to know where I live in the United States. They actually want the story of my culture, history, and ancestry. And so sometimes they'll ask, where are you really from? Meaning, you're not from here. You're from somewhere else. And this is a way, you can think about this as a microaggression, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Or we can just think about this as a question that people ask, a way to remind me of my own ethnic identity and to suggest that that ethnic identity is somehow important for understanding. Now, if we look um, at a recent snapshot of um, American society with its 325 million, about 325 million people, we see that 18% of the US population is Hispanic or Latino. Um, and uh, Hispanic and Latino is typically subsumed under, but not exclusively um, uh, subsumed under white as a category. And so uh, it's interesting where we can look at the ways in which ethnicity or ethnic categories can overlap with racial categories, but they can also sit in between them. So uh, we, we tend to identify white and black as two different racial categories and Hispanic or Latino as ethnicities within those. And so that there are some uh, Hispanics who could identify as white in terms of their identity, ethnic identity, and racial identity. And there are some Hispanics who could identify as black relative to their ethnic and racial uh, identity. So for example, if you were to look at Dominicans um, uh, as a Hispanic group, people um, um, from that country, uh, they may be more likely to identify as black racially and Hispanic ethnically. Um, whereas there are other groups of people, perhaps Cubans, for example, who are more likely to identify as white racially and as Hispanic ethnically. But almost 18% of the U.S. population is Hispanic or Latino, 
And most of these Hispanics in the United States are of Mexican descent. This shouldn't be too surprising in part because the United States shares an enormous border, very long border with Mexico. And so the possibility of Mexican migration into the United States is much greater than in other places. The remainder of the population, about 82%, is not Hispanic or Latino. Now, in America right now, 61% of the population identifies as non-Hispanic white, meaning white, but of some ethnicity other than Hispanic. This would mean people who identify as Irish American, Italian American, Polish American, they could be Scandinavian, um, they could be English, they could be Dutch, they could identify as Jews. Same thing. So about 61% of the population identifies as non-Hispanic white, meaning their racial categorization is white and they don't have an ethnic identity of being Hispanic or Latino. This number is declining in the United States. And one of the most important things, I shouldn't say most important, but an important dynamic in American society over the next 50 years is going to be the decline in the proportion of non-Hispanic whites as the total number of people in the United States. This also makes the United States an enormously heterogeneous society. So if we were to compare it to other kinds of societies, if we were to compare it to um, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, if we were to compare it to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, if we were to compare it to Korea, um, we would see an enormous racial and ethnic heterogeneity in the United States as compared to those other kinds of places. Um, and that racial and ethnic heterogeneity is in some people's minds, the defining feature of the United States, but it is also a source of a range of tensions in American society, a range of tensions that can be difficult to resolve. About 12% of the um, non-Hispanic uh, uh, population identifies black or African-American. And within this group, we're seeing enormous changes currently, and we're likely to see um, huge changes, again, over the next 50 years in the composition of this group. Why? Well, um, one scholar, uh, Jalika Saul, her spell, name is spelled D-I-A-L-I-K-A. -A. Uh, she actually was a doctoral student of mine. Saul is spelled S-A-L-L. -L. Has been working on the question of uh, the experiences of the recent immigrants from Africa and their children. Um, and she's part of a number of scholars who are interested in the changing character of blackness in America in light of African migration. So there's huge numbers of people who have migrated over the last 30 years from Africa to the United States, 40 or 50 years. But um, it's really, um, and as a proportion of black Americans, Recent migrants from Africa are becoming a larger and larger number within this group. And that is changing both our conceptualization of blackness and the experience of being black or African American in American society. Whereas previously, almost all black Americans in US society were the descendants of slaves. Now, there's this new adding of all kinds of people with different sets of social, historical, and cultural backgrounds. And that's fundamentally changing the character of race in America. So when we think about how it is that race changes, one of the things that we have to look at it ha is how it is that patterns of migration bring new waves of people who bring their own customs, traditions, senses of themselves, and how that works to fundamentally transform the identity of both a group of people and their experience in a place. In the late part of the 19th century, in the early part of the 20th century, we saw this with whiteness. And what I mean by that is um, that as waves of migrants from Europe came, poured into the shores of the United States because of a major industrial revolution that was happening with massive economic opportunity in the U.S. between the 1860s and early 1900s, there were huge groups of people who came in from um, Ireland, Italy, Spain to a lesser degree, but a wide range of, of countries throughout Europe where they didn't speak English. And these new migrants fundamentally transformed the concept of whiteness 
That is, they, they, they themselves became white or were embraced by a range of white Americans. But insofar as they became part of the group, they also transformed what it meant to be white. This, again, is what we mean by, by thinking about a concept as a social construct. The concept of whiteness fundamentally transformed as waves of migrants came into the country. In this sense, within the category of white, we see newfound variations and subsequent important transformations. And currently, within the category of black, we're seeing newfound transformations as new groups of blacks are moving to the United States. That is, Africans who are migrating from Africa to the United States over the last 34 years. And this is fundamentally changing the experience and understanding of blackness in America. This within group transformation is accompanied also by between group transformations. So a sociologist and scholar, Maria Abascal, A-B-A-S-C-A-L, Maria Abascal, has done really important work to show how um, with the rise of the Latino population in the United States, the racial organization of America is fundamentally changing. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that previously, America existed within a two-group racial paradigm. There were white Americans and black Americans. And between those two groups, there were obviously some Latinos, but in general, the Latinos were concentrated in the area south of the United States, along the Mexican border. They lived in some other areas as well, as well of course, but overall, that was the dominant place where in which Latinos um, lived. But more recently, there's been a massive rise in Latino immigration into the United States. And as you see, 18% now of the U.S. population identifies as Hispanic or Latino. That's a massive growth in that population. And so we have moved from a two-group paradigm in the U.S. to a three, or soon, as I'll say in a moment, maybe even a four-group paradigm. And so the other ways in which race changes is not just within groups, as new types of whites arrive and either are accepted or not into the category of whiteness, or as new Africans arrive and either are accepted or not into the category of black, and thereby potentially fundamentally changing those categories. It's also as groups interact with one another. So as Maria Augustal has demonstrated, that as Latinos have entered the country, Black Americans begin to think about themselves differently, and white Americans begin to think about themselves differently, in part because with more groups, it leads to different configurations of race. The fourth group that I mentioned are Asians. Now, it's interesting that we use the category Asian to encapsulate huge numbers of people who themselves would think about, them, would think about themselves as very, very different. But at least in the United States, once someone from Asia moves to the U.S., they simply become Asian. So the distinctions between Vietnamese and Chinese, between Japanese and Korean, they kind of disappear a little bit, at least in the American imagination. And that there becomes one large racial group of Asians within which there could be different ethnic groups, ethnic groups with shared history, culture, ancestry, and understanding as a, as a shared or imagined community. So that you could have uh, Chinese Americans as an ethnic group within the Asian American racial categorization, or you could have Vietnamese American ethnic group within um, the uh, uh, broad racial category of Asian. About 5% of the American population right now identifies as Asian. Um, and that group, however, has grown and is growing right now as Asians are beginning to make up one of the larger migrant groups in the United States. And in a little bit, we'll talk about the different racial and ethnic groups in the U.S. and how, in particular, migration is really important for that. Now, as we talk about um, race and ethnicity, one of the big questions is, like, are race and ethnicity real? So um, uh, here, I want to return us to an insight that I provided in the lecture on gender. And in that lecture on gender, I said, often, almost always, the variation between groups is greater 
with the variation within groups. And as the example I gave, I said, the difference between women is almost always greater than the difference between women on average and men on average. That is, women are more different from one another than they are similar, particularly when it comes to comparisons with men. The same can be said of race. So um, I want to sort of have two insights here. Um, the first is that there's no gene that biologists can find that determines which racial categories some people fall into, but that clearly separates members of one race from members of another. And so, you know, there's a constant search for the genetics of race, um, particularly among um, scientists, less so among social sciences, to say, ah, yes, this is what, these are these genetic differences between these groups that determine um, uh, their racial categorizations. But one of the reasons why it's so hard to find um, uh, a genetic basis of race is because, as I said before, racial categories change all the time. They, I mean, maybe not all the time, it's probably a little too bad, but they shift. They actually change um, a non trivial uh, amount. So when Irish Americans first migrated to the United States, they weren't really considered white. And then eventually they became white. There was a political process, an economic process, and a cultural process whereby Irish people began to be able to identify as white, as not being some other racial or ethnic group. And that was a struggle for Irish Americans because whiteness in the United States is the racial category of power. And so Irish Americans, insofar as they were able, wanted to be able to identify as white because it came with all kinds of institutional and organizational resources. But if social processes can help constitute race, it makes it very difficult to see how it is that single biological processes might serve as the foundation of race. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't any genetic similarities between groups. In fact, if we're going to define race by skin tone, then there are likely some genetic determinants or genetic determinants of that skin tone. And so we will see some commonalities. Similarly, insofar as populations have lived in concentrated places for long periods of time, we're likely to see some genetic similarities among those groups as well. However, as there's no single way in which to see a biological determination of race, we tend to think of race as sociologists, as social constructs, a concept that humans invented to help understand and justify some dimension of the social world. And social constructs are almost always political projects tied to social power. That is, political projects that seek to justify some form of domination. So racialized science was a way, it was a just, justification project, in part to justify the domination of one group over another, or the domination, in this case, of Europeans over other parts of the world. Now, this is not to say, again, I'll repeat, that other parts of the world don't have other justificatory projects as to why they should be the dominant group. But race, as a science, was largely invented in Europe at a particular period in time, tied with colonialization, when the Europeans were busy colonizing other parts of the world, and with the emergence of the slave trade, and justifying thereby their rights to enslave other foreign people and force them to do labor for them. For now, though, I want you to remember that racial groups are, in, are socially constructed from the perspective of the sociologist. And then that social construction, evidence of it is provided by, by the fact that historically it's different in different time periods and also in different places it's different. So if we were to look at race in Latin America, we would see a very different dimension of race than if we were to look at race in the United States. And finally, like other social categories, there's almost always more variation within the category than between it. Or put differently, a white person and a black person are likely to be more genetically similar to one another than two white people or two black people. It's a rather astonishing fact. Um, uh, fairly true, and it helps us see how the social construction of race 
is grounded not in a kind of sort of biological reality, but finally, just because something is socially constructed doesn't mean it isn't real. So race is a social construction, but that construction is very real for people in terms of how they live and experience their lives. And I'll end with this idea. We often think that just because something is socially constructed, maybe we don't often think it, but some of us may think, oh, just because something socially constructed means it isn't real. Social constructions are incredibly real. I'll give you one example. Money is a social construction. It is a set of pieces of paper that we just assume has some value associated with it. And we all kind of collectively orient ourselves around money as a social construction. If you think social constructions aren't real, you should give me all your money. Now, of course, you're not going to do that. And the reason you're not going to do that is because that money is a huge consequence for your everyday life. In the same way, race as a social construct is very real. So for me, the question is not, is race real or not? It's what kind of reality is it? And I would suggest that race is not a biological reality. It is a social reality. And as a social reality, it is very real. It is just not solely founded in genetics.